Okay, here we go, Curtis. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, I had to throw around Adam Robinson's name uh, to to get through to you, and I'm glad he worked because he's incredible. Um, so let's go. Introduce yourself, please. Okay, uh, I'm Curtis. Uh, I am a serial entrepreneur. Uh, I run my biggest company, Sport and Love of Goods. We do about 125 million dollars a year. Next year we'll do 200 million. <clears throat> we grow. I run other companies. Uh, we all do direct to consumer online, and uh, I've been doing online marketing for 30 plus years, and I'm pretty damn good at it. The beautiful thing, and um, in I, I mean, I prepare for this, and I've watched I think pretty much every interview you've had. I've read everything you wrote. Uh, it one of the sessions you throw out a name that's been my mentor for 30 plus years, and that's the incredible Seth Godin. Uh, he absolutely changed my trajectory of how I view marketing with Purple Cow, but we can talk about that later if you want. So, no, I, I, I that's that's fine. Um, the, the reason I usually mention Seth and where he comes up in mind is the way that he approaches his life in marketing. He has for decades, gets up every morning and writes, which is what he calls practice. <clears throat> if you know Buddhism, you know that meditation every day uh, is called practice. If you do yoga a lot, they call it a practice. It is actually something you do each day that puts you in a different mind state of understanding yourself, the world, how things interact, how you view it, and how your mind does it. And if you say, I'm going to write about marketing every single morning, what has happened, and put that together, rather than look for one secret somewhere every year or so that then you're going to apply, it changes the person you are rather than, oh, look, I learned another secret. I'll try to, I'm the same person, but I'm going to try to apply this. What he says is, hey, if you do this, you'll change your mind in subtle ways over time, that will build up and you'll understand marketing better. That's why, that's what I really love about Seth Godin is his lifestyle and the way that he views his own brain and his own marketing. Yep. Well said. So for anyone that follows you and listens to you, which I have uh, for a couple of days for sure, you you seem like a guy who's just happy, just all around happy. Is that a fair so, statement? Mariana's shaking her head that I'm happy. Um, now the good news is I, I believe I'm always happy. Okay. But I'm actually happy about 95% of the time. And then I crash down for a few hours or a day. And then I'm just relatively happy again. I have a, somebody explained it one time when they said some people, it's like you're in water and they're always struggling to keep their head above water. I'm buoyant. I, my head is always up there, but once a week, month or so, a friend will yank me down a little bit under the water for a couple seconds and it will scare the hell out of me. And then I'll just get happy again. I've lived a really great life. Uh, I've had a lot of crap happen. I've had a lot of things happen, but I am really energetic and I'm really happy and I live a beautiful life. So in, in one of your interviews, you use the term over the top baby. And, <laughs> and, and I, I, I don't know if you were talking about over the top as in the value and service you provide to your customers or that was sort of an encompassing term for you in terms of how you live. I, you know, if you've, if you've read a lot or if you've seen a lot with me, you know that I'm the youngest of four boys and all my brothers were bigger, stronger, and I had to be better looking and smarter than them. I had to be clever. I was fighting to win at every chance. When there's their friends are playing a board game and there's not a place for me, I sat for hours or days or years waiting to get part of that table so I could play that board game with them and win. Does that make sense? Yeah. If they're playing cards and they don't mm -hmm. have room, I'm the youngest. So I am looking to how do I win and how do I be more clever? I do everything I can just a little over the top. Does that mean customer service? Of course. You know, I'm famous for, we have an outlet store in Portland, Oregon. Uh, and whenever I'm walking through, I'll just stop in, start grabbing stuff and walking up to each person and handing them some a bag for free, a $200 leather bag and giving them a hug and say, thank you so much for making my life awesome by being a customer. And I'll be years later and I'll see those people. People I saw five years ago, 
and where I gave them something, they'll be coming in again and again saying, Curtis is this guy who believes in customer service. I believe it in marketing. I believe it in hiring. I believe it in what you do day to day. Now, I have that natural gift of energy and optimism and pushing forward, as you say, over the top type of thing. Not everyone has that, but doing things just a little bit better than the other guy, always a great idea. It does. You don't have to beat them by much to beat them by a lot in the long run, right? Right. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, brings back, I mean, Seth started with Purple Cow, but then there's a, the, the, there's another book called Differentiate or Die. For yep. many of us in business, if you want to be like everybody else, you're a commodity and you're just going to get slaughtered at some point. There's yeah, no absolutely. value. But so you you bring that to the top. Uh, the reason I kind of focus on, on your personal happiness is because I, I think the message that resonates with you for me, and I think for my audience with somebody like you is that it's you can be successful as an entrepreneur and be happy. You don't have to compromise, right? You've kept that balance really, really well. And for many of the people that I've coached in 12 years and people that I've worked with in a corporate world, it's not quite like that. It's a roller coaster for sure, but they can't find that bandwidth of happiness that allows them to get over the next challenge when it happens so you're so an this, example of somebody that that yeah, somebody yeah. somebody would say to me yeah I, I watched that thing with curtis and and he's amazing but i'm not like him i i can never think i'm going to be like him but that's not that's just the wrong approach i just pour more onto who i am and i've always done that right mm -hmm. i it just like i wasn't the biggest and the strongest so i had to work harder i had to do this i had to do this I was, I remember in high school, when you graduate, you get the superlatives. And my best friend was most likely to succeed and best looking. My other best friend was class legs and class body. And I was class clown and class personality, right? Because I didn't have the legs. I didn't have that. But I had to do something to fit in and have these wonderful people as my best friend. So I poured more onto who I am and not onto trying to be what they are. And that is always the secret in life. You want to be more of what you are because you are unique. I believe that with everything inside of me. And then number two, I have realized that people get reactions when they're negative. Mm -hmm. Okay. But it doesn't grow to anything over the long period of time. If every time you see somebody, they say, how are you doing? You say, oh my gosh, my life is terrible. You won't believe what happened to me. The next time that person sees you, they're less likely to want to ask how you're doing. Yeah. And so you subtly change how you view yourself and how you speak to other people. And all of a sudden, magically, your life actually does get better and you view things better. And so when they ask you, you can honestly say, people wish they had my life. I have a wonderful, wonderful life. I have great friends. I have great employees. I have a passion about all the things that I do. But that was not always the case. I mean, if you want to break it down, I'm a longtime recovering alcoholic. Mm -hmm. I was I was dead on the streets, going to die alcoholic 12 years ago. I oh. mean, it was gone. And there was I'm as bad as you get as an alcoholic. If I drank today, I'd be dead within a couple of years. There's no doubt about that. I am a sheer, great, wonderful, energetic guy. And I'm a horrible, horrible alcoholic. I'll make you laugh. I'll make you smile. But I will die because I will never stop after that first drink. Does that make sense? Yeah, yes. So I know what that is like. So I have had a lot of these things, but I look at all of those as blessings. I truly, to this day, there is nothing better than being an alcoholic who is now recovered, who has to understand I have to run my life a certain way so that I don't <laughs> crush and die in that other way. So I've had a lot of these battles, but boy, life is good. It truly is really, really wonderful. So, so Curtis, I think what, what you just ran through in the last couple of minutes was a, uh, to me, is a basic training in leadership because you have, what, 120 employees, something like that? Higher. Okay. Much higher. Much higher. Doesn't matter. <laughs> Everything over 100. There's a lot of them, right? <laughs> And, and and the key is in terms of, of being a business owner and an entrepreneur and, and the aspect about leadership is that your employees can tell if you're full of shit or not. 
They can tell yeah. when you're just spitting out whatever you read in some stupid book yesterday, some cute little slogan, but you're not a genuine human being. And so maybe, and, and I've seen this firsthand with people that I've coached in some companies I work for. As the owner of the company, you think you're fooling them, but you're not. So you can't do this alone. You need the 150, 200 employees to actually do the day-to-day -day work in order for the company to succeed. But they're not going to do this unless they are fully embracing who you are and what you represent, which is happy, which is passion, which is hard work, commitment to customers, right? Value. If you're not the real thing, it's not going to work. You know, and I remember years ago when I was in a, in a small family business, the owner was, I, I won't put names on him, but he wasn't really that smart. And he used to have a meeting in the office, call everybody in and use the word, you know, we, 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 we. And after we finished, I walked over to his office and I said, did you watch everybody's faces? Because the we doesn't work, okay? It's you and you're cheap and you don't share the wealth and, and you play games. And for somebody to get a raise 15 cents an hour, they have to humiliate themselves. There's no we here. And he says, well, what do you mean? I said, stop thinking about them, okay? So my, my point was, um, I believe, and I think you demonstrate that you cannot be successful as a business owner unless you are genuine about the things you believe in, right? And you I think that I think that there's a lot of formulas in business, and I do believe if you believe that business success is making money, there are people who are jerks and idiots and dumb, and if you do enough of the right things, you can still make money. Now. If your success in business is you want to make enough money to live a good life, to have the people around you live a good life, that the majority of your days and hours and minutes are better and more fulfilling and awesome. No, jerks cannot <laughs> be successful at creating that type of a business. I don't think that there's an elusive thing that you have to be the greatest person in the world to make money. I've known people who are assholes who have made a lot of money. Mm -hmm. But if you want to build a business and a life, you better be a good person. And I'm going to give you a story that I, I've never told this on a podcast or anywhere, anyplace else. But as I say, I'm a long-term recovering alcoholic, okay? Mm -hmm. And I lived in Portland, Oregon with my girlfriend. Uh, I'm still together for 10 years. And I came home one day. Now, we never locked our house in Portland. Just never locked our I From Montana originally, I've never locked my house. And I walked home one day and I turned the knob and it was locked. And my mind jumped into, oh my gosh, what did I do wrong? Because I was thinking back to my drinking days when I'd go to my house or my girlfriend's house or something like, and if they've locked me out, they're upset at me. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. And yes. my mind went to, what did I do wrong? And I started listening to things. I said, wait a second. I am honest in everything I do. I have nothing to hide. It's not possible I did anything wrong. Well, we had a visitor visiting our house and they thought it would be safe to lock the door. But there was that sense of fear of what did I do? And then the acknowledgement where if you do things honestly and above board and with kindness, and with good intention, you may make mistakes, but you have not done anything that you should ever be ashamed of, that you, you are not building on and being a better person. And it seems like a weird story, but the fear that hit me of what did I do wrong? And then the blessing that I got of, I haven't done anything wrong. I, I haven't done any of these things. I just live a good life. That's a really, yeah. it's a really nice place to be. And it's interesting, and and Mariana probably knows this, that if something goes wrong in a company, I, I think you're, instead of pointing fingers at anybody else, it seems like the first thing you ask, is it me? Did I give the wrong direction? Did I, Always. right? Which is, oh. again, it, it's it's a sense of humility as a business owner. Uh, you know, I keep thinking Zig Ziglar, right? Most of the young guys today don't know who he is, but... You know, he, there's two things that I remember from his days. If you're pointing a finger at someone, there's three fingers pointing right back at you, which is a great lesson in don't point fingers. And the other piece was, if you want anything in life, you make you help other people get what they want in life, right? Which is both of these are sort of the credos that you live by, right? It's yeah. it's me first and then help you next.
Yeah, and there's a weight of taking the responsibility because I own all my companies outright. It's 100% me. And uh, and I'm the energy and I'm the thought and I'm the visionary and I'm the dreamer. So when something goes wrong, it really is me. I've actually had a twist on that is I take the blame so often that my people are starting to yell at me and say, it is not your fault. It is my fault. Stop taking the blame. I'm the one who messed this up. Please don't give me the out. Yeah. Because I'm like, well, I should have saw that coming. I should have hired better. I should have this. I should have told you this. And now they actually, Mariana's asking me for a code. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> And American Express, they always, if you log in from something different, they wanna they wanna verify that it's me on my cell phone. Yeah. Um so yes, I here's the thing. You have to take that weight of responsibility when you run a big company and you're gonna be an entrepreneur. You have to realize that it is you. If you do not get it done, nobody will. The head of uh, marketing, I have a guy named Maverick, very famous, one of the best marketers in the world. Maverick said, Curtis, if this company does not do a half a billion dollars, it's because we failed. Me and you, everyone else can do their job, but it's because we did not take it to that next level. And I take that weight of responsibility seriously. And not everybody wants that. Yeah, I like that. I like the competition. I like to get up in the morning and as I'm doing the various things, be thinking, how do I make my life and other people's lives better and push forward? I, so, I really do. This is not um, a bullshit thing. I really do think that. There, you know, not everybody that's going to listen and watch this knows you. So, um I'm going to read through quickly the, the I'm going to go through the too long must listen piece that I didn't yet do because I, I, I wanted you to do your thing. Um, okay. Curtis life reads like a dime novel with quick changing scenes and outlandish characters. One winter he spent in Zen monastery trying to make eight Buddhist monks laugh while meditating and reading Calvin and Hobbes. He has spoken to thousands of people in business success, lost millions in the dot-com crash of 2000, 2001, and launched a dueling piano bar in Salt Lake City. On a friendly challenge, which is really what I wanted to get to, he took a scrap of leather, designed a journal, and propelled it into a, back then it was 100 million, now it's 120, destined to go to 200 and up, a brand which was named top 10 fastest growing apparel and accessory digital companies. So the dare was, when I a thing that I remember is, I don't know if you had a fight with your girlfriend or something happened, you told her, quit your job. And she said, but what are we going to do? And you said, watch me. I'm going to build a $100 million company. It, it's a little, and I've never quite explained this exactly. So if your people have made it this far, they get to hear this. There was a mixture between my best friend and cousin, who I'm very, I love to death, but I'm very competitive with him, and my girlfriend. So I met this young lady and we got along really good. I was doing a lot of yoga. I wasn't doing much with my life, right? I was trying to determine what's going to be next. And she was much younger than me and she was out of college. Uh, we're still together. I love her to death. And she had a bad job. I said, quit your job. And she said, what will I do if I quit my job? And I said, oh, I forgot to tell you, I'm a marketing genius. <laughs> we, I can create this company. And she said, come on, you have ne you've never even mentioned the internet or marketing. You cannot be this marketing guy, right? And she quit her job anyhow. She said, but I'm going to believe in you and I'm going to quit my job. And then she said, what are we going to sell? <laughs> and I took a scrap of leather and made a little leather journal. And I said, we're going to start selling leather journals and products on the internet. And my cousin, who's this very wealthy individual, said, that's the stupidest idea I've ever heard. And so the mixture of her putting her belief into me and my cousin saying it will never work was the energy I needed to say it's going to work. So I made leather journals and we started going out to art festivals to see what people liked. And we literally do like $1,000 in a weekend. And then we got to 5000 in a weekend. And then to 10,000. And then we would go to some art festivals and do 20, 30. We did $40,000 in a weekend at an art festival selling little leather products. Went on to Etsy, broke it, and then went into our company right now. But it was the, I'm going to show you in a kind, competitive way, right? You know, I love 
I grew up and I love them. But the bet was, this is the stupidest idea. You will go out of it. And I said, let me show you. And that's the company to this day. Did she ask you, what if it doesn't work? What happens? No. no. She just blind faith. Okay, you said it. I mean, you're very convincing. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I wouldn't really doubt it. But what made you pick the, I think one of being a refillable letter journal, right? Is that, uh, what made you, you know, pick that as, so you're a marketing guy and yeah. marketing the, the brilliant marketers are able to identify something, a problem that's going unsolved or a something that people want but haven't gotten. You pick that. Why? Of all the things in the universe. When I was in fifth grade at Franklin Elementary School in Great Falls, Montana, I had the greatest elementary school teacher of all time. He had big black Michael Caine glasses. His name was Mr. Schroeder. And we went in the first day and he, after lunch, he said, I'm going to read to you after lunch every day. And he pulled out The Hobbit by J.R.R. Tolkien. And he had a big pipe, you know, like, you know, I, I'm sure he didn't smoke it, but I picture him smoking it. And he read us The Hobbit and The Fellowship and The Two Towers and The Return of the King. And for a, a, a very smart, imaginative fifth grader, having this amazing teacher read these books was life-changing. And I bought the, got the books for Christmas from my parents. I've read them every year for 30 years after that, once a year. And I wanted a leather journal just like Bilbo had in The Lord of the Rings to write everything down. And I asked my parents, can I have a leather journal? And they said, yes. And at Christmas, I got a diary. I swear to God, it was pink. It had a little lock on it. And I'm like, no, this is not what I want. This is a diary. I want a journal. I also tried to use it, but it wasn't refillable. So when you write on it, you're afraid that your writing is bad because it wasn't broken right off the bat. So I thought it has to be refillable. It has to be. So later on in life, I went looking for leather journals. Where do you go? You go to Barnes and Noble and they're made in China. And you can't even tell if it's real or not. The leather, if it's real or not. I said, no, Indiana Jones didn't put the secrets in a pink diary. He didn't put it in a Barnes and Noble journal. He put it in a beautiful, vintage, gorgeous, leather wrapped thing. So I went down and I said, I want this. There's got to be other people that want this. And because it's a natural good, leather can be, is always being reproduced. It's a byproduct of the beef industry. You throw the hides out. It is something that is, it's environmental friendly. It is good. I want this. Let's see what people will do. And then we made that journal and we made it better and better and better. And we just started blowing up. Then we went into other leather goods. And I think we're now the largest leather bag maker in North America. So, but but you were going to art festivals, right? Initially? Yeah, started um, there, yeah. Was that the target audience? People that, that artistic? No, it was... A great way, what people don't understand is that an art festival is like an e-commerce store, okay? It's almost identical. So if you think about it, I had all, I would go set up at these art festivals and you would open at 10 o'clock in the morning. Now, most artists would set up their booth one way, every single art festival, and they would just leave it at that, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. I would watch crowds for 20 minutes about where's the sun, where's the direction, who's looking which way, how fast are they going? And then at 10.30, I would start moving walls and ripping it down and changing it. And all of a sudden, I'd move another wall and then boom, the traffic would just start flowing right into my booth. Everyone thinks I'm so smart, I know the answer. I set this booth up once, I'm gonna do it, but no. All venues, all art festivals, all of these big art street festivals have a different flow. What catches people's eye? Where are they coming from? What? Where are you at in this thing? And we would change it. All of a sudden, our booth would fill up, and I'm like, I got it, right? Flow is very important. Same thing with an e-commerce store. You don't just set up a website and says, this product doesn't work. It's how do you tinker with it? Where's the traffic? What are they doing? Next, I would always take two chairs with me and sit in this art festival, right? One empty sitting next to me. And I found out that when I started talking to people, if I got someone to sit next to me and we just chatted, 
it made the entire booth feel more homey and friendly and wonderful rather than people walk in. I'm like, can I help you? You want to buy something? Oh, I would yeah. ignore everybody. And uh, your booth would fill up and it would fill up and it would fill up. And then I would get a line of people buying. And then I would talk to the people in line and delay it. So the line got longer and I got to know these people and then they would leave. And the next day they would come back with 10 people saying, you've got to meet Curtis. You've got to see this product. I want to buy more of these. And then your compounding interest is everything builds on each other. It's the same thing as a website. It's, the metaphors are exactly the same. The processes, don't just set up a store and expect people to buy. How do you subtly move? Where's the traffic? How do you be more friendly? How do you keep coming back? Where's your retention? It's the same principles over and over. And you can learn that in any business. If your business is doing $10,000, you can be learning principles that are the same that you'll need when you're a hundred million. And so, so the first part, we had a, a basic training on leadership, which was how do you run a company, but being genuine, being who you, who you are. Genuine so the employees can believe in you. This was a beautiful second basic training in marketing that so many people just completely take for granted. And one of the things that's, that, that I was struck with, because that's also been my philosophy, and I learned that from my dad, who had a tiny little grocery store in Israel, cornered, yeah. cornered grocery store. And I always tell people that it, 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 we all live in an apartment building. So this was a corner street. That was my dad's grocery store. We lived upstairs. You walk a block in any direction, there was another grocery store competing with him. Nothing fancy. It's the same stuff. And my dad was really uneducated, nothing, just had this intuitive survival mechanism that I have to serve every customer that comes through the door. Because if I don't, all they have to do is make a left instead of a right when they come out of their apartment building. And I've lost a customer. I've watched him do this as, as a kid. And, and you, you would like the story, but I'm, I don't want to take time telling stories about my stuff. But there was one, one time, there was a lady who was married to a doctor. And she, she insisted on being called, not her name, but Mrs. Doctor somebody, right? She, want, she wanted a piece of deli meat that my dad didn't carry because it was too expensive and nobody asked for it. And when she actually asked for it, she berated him. Like, and, and he was standing there crying that he failed a customer and she left. So this is Israel, this is, I think July, August. He left the store, he jumped on his bicycle, drove across town, found the place where they sell the deli meat, came back and cut it to whatever she wanted, said to me, come with me. And we walked up four flights of stairs, knocked on the door, and he said, I'm sorry, here's the deli meat, right? And she said, well, let me pay you. And he said, no, I don't want you to pay me. I'm sorry that I failed you. Please forgive me. And we walked away and I said, dad, she's nasty. She was a real bitch. Why would you do this? Right? And he said, because every single customer matters. And this is sort of like your credo. You're in an art. One of the things that you tell about, about the, the art festivals, and, and I remember the things that resonate with me, is that when somebody didn't buy, you chased their ass and wanted to know, why didn't you buy? This is, yes, market, this is marketing. This is marketing. Yeah. Right? You chased them. I would, I would say, oh, my gosh. What what is what is the problem here? And they'd say, well, maybe my daughter would like this, or do you think uh, she really likes Star Wars? And so I had to create this new system of hot stamping to put Star Wars things on it, mm -hmm. or she would like this or this or lined or unlined or this size or this thing. And I'd like, how do I make everybody happy? If they say I love this, why aren't they buying? And what do I do on that? And that was really, that was something really big. And your father's story is really important. At the very beginning, you said, I've spoken to thousands of people. I've spoken to a million people. I used to be a public, I've, I've been in front yeah. of a lot of people. And not a lot of people know this, but the key to speaking to a room of a thousand or 2000 people is not speaking to a room. Mm -hmm. When you start, you talk to this person and then you turn and you talk to this one. And then you talk to that guy and you talk to that woman. And after an hour and a half, Every person in that theater believes you looked and spoke to them personally. That's the key. It was taught to me by Scotty Anderson, the greatest public speaker I've ever seen. He would make you feel important. Even if it was only for five or 10 seconds, you thought he looked over and he was talking to me. That's the same thing your father said is every single person who comes in the store is important. And when you're doing internet marketing, you have to make every person who comes in 
feel important. As we started up our company, what made us very successful is my girlfriend said, what am I going to do? And I said, customer service. Now, she's the most kind yogi you've ever met in your entire life. So when someone would write one question, she would write a kind, page-long, wonderful outreach response that these people were blown away. They had never heard of that, of, of anybody being that kind for a simple, stupid question they wrote, right? Yep. That turned into her training our customer service who trained the next level, the next level, the next level. Now we have people with master's in creative writing, writing the emails back to people because yep. it's an art to communicate with that person. Yeah, and just like you know, my dad showed it, you showed it, uh, th there's no secrets about marketing. It's really connecting with your customers and yes. listening so that yeah. the, the best way to grow a business is by listening to your customers. They're going to give you the best ideas of how to grow a business and new product. It's not going to come from a bunch of marketing guys sitting in a room, rolling their eyes and coming up with some cute little thing. It comes from, from the people you serve. And I've done way too many medical conferences that I care to remember all around the world. And, and again, what you said about your booth, you know, when you go into a conference, traditional conference, they put the tables in front, right? And you put all your stick, all your stuff, whatever it is in the front. And people walk by and you always say, can I help you? Can I help you? And one that we said, why are we putting a barrier, right? It's just so impersonal. So we opened the booth and put the tables on the side. And it was really open space, inviting people to come in. And simple stuff. But again, the, the recurring thing with you is that success, it's not just that the Curtis is a marketing genius. You could be a marketing genius and still be a failure. But the key yeah. is you take your wisdom, but then you go and test it out by speaking to the actual customers so that yes. you can refine your message or your products or your service or whatever you do. The fact that your girlfriend writes a, a one-page reply to a question, uh, it just blows my mind because uh, we are surrounded today with chats on websites. Most of them are bots, which are automatic. So the, the problem is, and I, I'm curious about your take, Curtis, because um, I guess we are old timers, right? The People are dehumanizing the way businesses run because of the cost of resources. There are not too many people that take the time to do what you do in connecting with your audience. There are a few it, companies that do this, right? It, but it's not many. True. That, that's very true. Uh, however, if you think back into 70s, 80s, 90s, retail was, everything was person person. You went to this drugstore or you went to Sears or you went to Kmart or you went to the local drugstore, you went to your father's market. So you had someone who was running the company or at least running that retail establishment who was there day to day. And you hired a front force of people that they see. When you move to an e-commerce type of a system, you lose that. And I said that very early on in our company. I created an outlet store in the base in the building that we own, in the basement where all of our people work above it, right? They're all working in this big building, okay? And I wanted them, the door doesn't go in the back. You have to walk through the store to get to the upstairs. Mm -hmm. And I said, everyone would come up and said, it's full of people. They love our product so much. They could have been working there for two years if they were working remote or someplace else. And they never saw how happy that customer was to buy it. They never realized how much people love our product. But every day as they walk down or go to lunch, they walk through and they're like, people love our product. And that pride that they got gains in everything that they do. That gains in the way that they write. That's the way they do social media. That's the way they treat each other. Because you're not just a cog. You're someone who is helping create a product that people love. So I, I want to tell you another story where somebody, to this day, he's the guy that I learned the most as, as an employer, uh, kind of gave me an offer I couldn't refuse from taking me from another company. And when we sit down, I said, Jen, can I have it in writing? And and in, so I wanted whatever he committed to, which was which was amazing. Can I have it in writing? And he looked at me grinding his teeth and he said, there's no one in this company that has anything in writing. I later on learned, because I did go to work for him, that that was his way of not screaming and yelling. He never raised his voice, but grinding his teeth 
was showing you that he was incredibly upset. And this was a company, the largest I ever worked for, but it's 350 employees. And he said, not one person in this company has anything in writing. And he looked at me and he said, do you want to know why? And I said, yes. And he said, because if my word means nothing, then they still come every day and punch in and punch out, but they're not really working for the company. I want people to work here because this is the place that they spend more time than usually their live one and family. I want them to feel that this is theirs, that they can they can give me and the company the best of who they are. But if my word as an owner, whatever I committed to, it's going to happen. Because if it's not, I'm wasting my time. There's still people floating around the building, but they're not really working, right? And th this, again, another lesson in leadership and management that you, for you, it's natural because you, you just like that naturally. But for so many entrepreneurs, they miss that piece. Employees are not workers. You can't do this alone, right? You you need them. And they need to, to feel, they need to, to really be, wake up in the morning and feel excited about going to work for Curtis Matsko. Not because of Curtis, but because you represent something that gets them fulfilled and they can go home and feel great about what they did. Yeah. Mariana, are you thrilled every day to come to work? Every single day. Every single stinking day. And I'm <laughs> thrilled you come to work too. There so you go. what I learned though, and this is a, the great point on this, about we talked earlier about being genuine and being who you are. And that's very important. What I learned is when I started after a couple of years as the employees count started to move up and up and up, they would say, well, maybe you should speak to the employee in a different tone, right? So when I was ungenuine, I would scare the hell out of people, right? So I remember one day I walked, we were having trouble. We were making all this stuff in Portland and this girl was having a little bit more trouble than others. So I stopped by and I said, how are you doing today? <laughs> she said, good. And I'm like, Hey, you're doing a great job. I want you to know you're doing a really good job, but could you count what you're doing today? Because we want you to lead this, but if you need help, we will hire to get you help. Is that okay? And I said it in a completely non-Curtis way to say it, right? I led to my office a half hour later. They said, she's crying. She's wondering what she did wrong. She's wondering what happened because I wasn't me. Yeah. She didn't know this tone of voice of this idiot who was trying to talk in some voice I've never spoken to in the world before. So not a lot of people know this. I, in my own company, I've been over 5,000 interviews. I interviewed and hired the people for my company because I wanted everyone to say, there's a lot of places you can go to work in the world, right? It, they're just, it, there's great. You can be successful at anything. This is the way that we do our company. If you understand the love and energy that I have and the quality of people, if you can listen to me and get me, then you'll love this company. We found out if they hadn't met me and then they saw my personality come in and they'd never met before and they're working, I could scare them. Mm -hmm. But if they'd sat through an interview with me for 30 minutes, they're like, that's just Curtis. That's exactly who he is. And they were never frightened of me again. They realized that I was there because we're this team to move forward. So I purposely sit in every interview, at least some part of the process to say, hey, do you want to work here? If you do, we're going to push you. We're going to make you better. You're going to be a better person. If not, please go. We, we love it. Go be successful in the world. You're a great person, right? Yep. They have to know who I am because I can't change me. It's fake when I change who I am, and it's not good. So because you're so hands-on and intimately connected to your your team, do you have an HR system where they have, uh, you know, quarterly reviews or annual reviews? I can't I, I can't see you doing it, but maybe you have it because because it, it's two hundred people. I don't know. It's a it, more. Uh, it's famous. It's famous story uh, that when I hired my first HR person, I basically said. I don't know what you do. I literally do not know why I would ever hire an HR person. I literally don't get it. And to this day, I, I have wonderful. Her name is Courtney. She is phenomenal. She is kind and wonderful and charming. And everyone feels comfortable communicating with her. But she teaches people about me. She says, you don't, when Curtis is in the office, you don't set up an interview or if you need to speak to it, don't wait for your quarterly review. And if you have an idea, don't set up a meeting next Tuesday with Curtis, right? 
When you see him walking from here to there, you run up and walk next to him and say, I've got an idea and you pitch it to him right there. Because if he likes it, he'll say, well, not this, not this. I like this. Why don't you work on this and we'll meet next Tuesday? So instead of this big buildup where they're let down, if they have an idea, it has to come to me right now. I have uh, WhatsApp because I'm international. I'm actually in Mexico right now. And I tell people right now, if you want to communicate, you send a text or you hit the video call. And they said, what if you're busy? And I say, I won't answer the phone. Like, it's that simple. Don't write and say, can I have a meeting next Thursday to talk to you about something? I want the immediate feedback. I can handle more information than people think that I can't, right? So if you want to talk to me, you talk to me. And the people who move up, I talk to every single day in my company. I'll talk to them at nine o'clock at night. They have an idea, they'll call up and we will just sit and chat and they'll get more confident, more clarity, more belief in what they're doing because we've come up with that together. They haven't done it independently. I can't stand the six month or year things. I tell people I, if they do them, I'm not part of them. If we want to communicate, yeah. is the day to communicate, not in six months. Because some people will literally wait for that day to tell you what they're thinking. And I'm like, if you thought this three months ago, why didn't you say it then? Well, I thought this was the appropriate time. It's not, yeah. it's three months too late. If yeah. you got and, something, say it out loud. And, to, and too often people look at HR completely from, from a wrong perspective, at least. Absolutely. I've never done it this way. The, the role of, of a review is not to tell you what you've been doing wrong for a year. I mean, my performance review question with an employee <laughs> And I, I coach my clients to do the same thing is, what can I do for you? What can I do to get you more excited, to more productive? What type of training would you like? Is there anything going on in your life that I can be part of and help you? This is, this. it's not a performance review. Obviously, if you don't perform, you're out, okay? Uh, but it, it's, people look at HR too often as, oh, it's about benefits and it's about, well, we'll tell them a year from now what they did wrong. No, why don't you tell them right away so they can improve, right? It's, it's so much easier. Hey. I found HR to be this thing where people go if they have a problem. Yeah. I have a problem with this person. I have a problem with this and I have a problem with that. And I, <clears throat> I've been working with Courtney to say, in this world, the best thing you can teach, especially our new and our younger employees, is that if you have a problem, you do not go to a second party and say, I have a problem. You go to that person. Because I hire really nice people. If they're, if these amazing, kind, wonderful managers, if you're afraid of them, you are afraid of life. They are kind and wonderful and caring. And if you have to go to a middle person, oh my gosh, you've got, you got some work to do on you. And the best way to solve that is go right to the thing. Hard conversations or uncomfortable conversations are the way we grow in this world. Yeah. It is not by going to an HR person and say, can you send a note to Sally and tell her I'd like to talk to her? That is not the way that things work. You go to the person and say, hey, I think we should be doing this, or I think this. And you learn how to communicate in doing something that's constructive, that helps you build a company. So HR, Courtney, I love you. You're, you're fantastic. You no, know every day, I wish I had no HR department. We don't want people to stick it to us because we're not, we're not, destroying HR. HR has an important function within each company, but it's too often misunderstood on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, if something doesn't doesn't work well, then go speak to that person. If that person, it's not working, then fine, you can go up the chain. But it's really more about getting together and making things better than complaining. That, that's really the, the focus. Without a doubt. And I, yeah. I did this recently, and I'm really proud of this. I taught Courtney something new. So she was getting to the end of the interview. We're going to hire somebody, right? We really like them. And what was happening 90% of the time are like, well, I know you offered this, but I think it would be better if I started for this. And they'd always try to do that extra three or five, whatever thousands of dollars on top, they would always try to push that negotiation, which I appreciate people who are trying to negotiate, right? <clears throat> and I said, Courtney, I went in one day and I said, this is what you do. And I said, if I offered you $20,000 less, you should take this job. Because if you're good, I'm going to 
get more and more on you and you're going to become great. And there's no greater company to work with and stop thinking about what that extra thousand dollars will be and look at what having a great company and great people and being part of this. You, if I gave you this job and didn't pay you, you should say, Curtis, I will take this for three months. If you knew how great you could get by working here, you would be begging me to work for free. Now, I'm going to let you do it at our agreed amount. And when you're successful, you will move up. And if you're less successful, you can go someplace else and do that someplace else. But, and I've said that to a couple of people and it did not take within an hour of them finding out my phone number and calling me personally and saying, please, I want this job. And what that does is it's that persuasion, that idea of they're coming to prove themselves. Mm -hmm. They're not coming to, they're coming to better themselves. They're not coming because they got an extra $5,000. Yeah. yeah. And that attitude can change their life. They don't even know that that's the right attitude to have, right? They do not even know that. Yeah. But I, it's true. And so Chris, started- what, what was the first job ever? Curious. How'd you leave your mark on that job? What was that? It's a famous story. Uh, I was home from college. And I'm sitting around watching TV and my dad said, good news, I found you a job. You're going to be a box boy at the Tiger IGA on 10th Avenue South in Great Falls. So at the grocery store, they push the things down and I would put things in a bag for the women and or the men and take it out to the car. So I, I didn't want this job, but I couldn't say no to my father. So the first day I went there and I did this and I hated it. That night I could not sleep, could not sleep. And I got up the next day because I knew if I woke, when as soon as I woke up, I had to go to work. I went the second day and I hated it. I wasn't, I just, I didn't like it. Third day, I'm dreading making it through the summer. And this woman is talking to Diana, who is the main cashier. She's pushing these cans of fruit or cans of vegetables down to me. And I said, she said, I'm looking forward in six months, I get two days off and my husband and I are going to go on a trip to visit my sister in Spokane, Washington. And I thought in my heart, I don't think I can make three months of this job. And her looking forward to in life is getting two days off in six months so she can drive five hours to Spokane. And I'm turned to go outside and the manager walked by and said, hurry up, hurry up. And I had asked about this guy because that's all he had said. The manager just walked around going, hurry up. And I said, I, I was hyper when I was a kid. I have energy now. I had a lot of energy then. I ran everywhere. And I'm like, why is he saying hurry up? And she, they go, that's his management style. For 20 years, he's never said anything other than hurry up. And I pushed the card at him. And I gave the universal. And I walked out so proud. Three days, two and a half days I made it. And I started to drive home. And I thought, oh my gosh, I have got to go tell my dad that I just quit the job that he got. Hmm. And I'm freaking out. And I start driving over the Missouri River, heading toward my house. And I look down and the country, Metal Art Country Club in Great Falls is there. And I saw him taking the, the tarps off the pool. And I r- parked, ran in. I said, who's the manager here? And they're like, Nancy. And I knew who Nancy was. I'm like, hi, Nancy. I would like you to give me a job as a lifeguard. And she said, are you a lifeguard? And I said, no. And she said, "Um, why should I give you this job? And I said, well, I just quit my job. I can't go home without having a job or my dad's going to kill me. Um, Please give me a job. She said, well, I can't for another month until you take the class to become a lifeguard, right? Mm -hmm. But she said, what I will do is I will pay you we have people climbing over the fence who are sleep or swimming in the pool at night so i will pay you twice what i was making at the tiger iga to sleep in the guard room on the couch so that kids don't jump over the fence so i walked in i said dad guess what i quit my job and i got a job paying me twice as much to sleep at the country club and he was like you little you're like it's like how does everything always work out well, number one, I ask. Number two, I'm not going to stay in a bad situation that is for me or where somebody is. And so I did that. The best part of the story is the reason I knew Nancy is because I was friends with her son. 
it was me and her son that were jumping over the fence that were swimming <laughs> in the pool. So I got paid twice the money to sleep at the pool and keep myself from jumping over. And now I didn't have to jump over the fence because I had the keys. So that was my first job. Amazing. So um, we're getting close to the hour and I got a lot more stuff to do, but I'm not going to keep you. Um, Curtis, who inspired you? From a, from a personal standpoint or business standpoint, is this is there a one person that you can look back and say, "Yeah, that person left an imprint on me that defined who I am," or was it all self-made kind of? No, not nothing self-made in this world. No, no, we're influenced. As I, I know, I started this off talking about Mr. Schroeder in in fifth grade, and Mr. Stepman in sixth grade, and Mr. Heikus in in eighth grade, and my basketball coaches and my football coaches. And I knew, uh, and and then I, I went and did to college a long time. Got a lot of college degrees. I was going to do my PhD work. I was going to be a college professor yeah. and I quit. I realized I wouldn't be happy. And I saw a speaker, a public speaker named Scotty Anderson. And I got a job for three days to go out on a road crew and see this public. And I just stood in the back behind the tables, right? Like he did this and he turned sales and marketing into an art where he would get up in front of 2000 people and he would speak and that whole room would be enraptured and he would we'd go out to eat afterward we'd go to the movies and he said curtis i let them know who i truly am and at the end of the presentation they're going to trust me to do or buy whatever i tell them because sales is had communication and a connection and a trust and he literally changed what I did. I saw sales and marketing as something that was beautiful and artful and noble and not selling a used car. Yeah. So to this day, <clears throat> he, his presentation, I know 20 minutes of that from hearing it for three days, almost word for word, because it was so powerful. And my brain has walked through those stories again and again. And then I said, wow, sales and marketing is what I can be good at. And I see the beauty in it. I literally see the beauty of it. It is a phenomenal, phenomenal profession. Yeah, and, and I hope that resonates with, with people that listen and watch because um, it, it's an incredibly competitive universe that we live in and survival is tough. But I think the one thing that resonates with who you are and how you built your company is that you never really compromise the principles of the things that you believe in, right? Um as opposed to a lot of people that just make <laughs> shit up to try and convince someone to buy from them. And I mean, one of the favorite sayings, I think it was JFK. I still, I always apply it to marketing. You can fool some of the people, some of the time, a lot of people, some of the time, but you can't fool all the people all the time. So yeah, maybe you'll make some sales, but if you're not genuine, if your products are crap, eventually it catches up to you, right? It, it works. It, I want to correct you on one thing and not in a bad way, but you said like, yeah, it's fine. you'll never, you'll never uh, compromise your principles. I make mistakes all the time. I'll probably do something that I'll look, oh, well, that wasn't smart, right? Because we move very, very quickly. It's the constant self-reflection of who you are to say, sorry, guys, that was a mistake. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I, in no way, I, the, one of my gifts is to be so strong in my personality and my idea of where we're going. But if some, we all say this and this and this, and somebody at the meeting says something, I'll look at them and go, oh, wow, that makes sense. Okay, everybody, I was completely wrong. They are right. A and that is a gift. So you have to be self-reflective of yourself. The world changes, you change. You don't know everything when you make all the decisions. If you're going to be unsuccessful in business, you're making decisions before the right time to make that decision. You don't know all the data. So you're going to make mistakes all the time. Mm. You need to be able to rein that back in when you can to do something better. What's the biggest mistake you've ever made? Boy. If I had chosen anything different, I wouldn't be where I am. I'm really happy where I am. Hmm. I just, 
I have messed a lot of things up, but it's all turned out to be a great learning and who I am. I just, I'd have to really think about that because I, yeah. I can't. I lost tens of millions of dollars when I was younger from a company I built up and the stock market crashed and I had just sold the company and we lost it all. But that was a gift. My drinking, as I say, I drank for a number of years. That's a gift. If I had not went through that and corrected that and learned from that, I wouldn't be the person who could build what I'm doing right now. So most of the gifts I have are stupid things I did. Yeah. So uh, <clears throat> I no, don't it's... think about that one, but I don't know what it is. No, it, I, I think you answer it beautifully. It's it's not a one thing or another, but the, the, the point is, whatever mistakes you've made have gotten you to where you are today, which is a fulfilled, happy uh, person who is equally concerned about the happiness and fulfillment of the people that surround you, which is a great thing. So um, if I gave you a billboard in Times Square in New York, and it's all yours, Curtis, what would you put on? I would probably take of the 10 top people in my company, eight of them are women. And people always hear about me and Maverick, the marketing arm, but it's not the people who really run my company. And I would take and put a picture of those eight people and tell every woman and in, in, in the world that you're better than you think you are and you can run this whole damn world. All you have to do is have a little bit of confidence in yourself. My key in business is I hire amazing women who have a great ability and all I have to do is say, you can do it. And as they gain more and more confidence, they're unstoppable. A lot of men think they're a lot better than they are. Women don't, but they have a much higher ceiling. <clears throat> so I get to do that. I would take a picture of them who are some of the most amazing people I've ever met in my whole life and say, hey, every single girl, woman, anybody, you can do what you want. You really are the power behind world it's not the jackass man who says he can do it it's the woman who truly knows that she can that's where the power really is and they're better looking than me so i'd throw them out there yeah it, it's interesting because i grew up in a culture in israel where women are, are very much equal to men and we you get drafted and you serve in the army like everybody else so this whole concept of what we just talked about is still foreign to me even though i've been here for 30 plus years um the fact that women always have to prove themselves for whatever reason, we're like, why, right? Um, we look at the way we were raised by uh, our mothers. Um, it's a phenomenal skill to have to raise a kid. Forget about carrying that thing for nine months. You and I will be miserable if we had to do all that and then give birth and then have the responsibility of forming and shaping and taking care of a kid. Uh, we don't have that as men. I mean, we could pretend. And to do it all the time. I'm a big WNBA fan. Uh, I, it was when I thought of New York, I thought of Sabrina Ionescu, my favorite a WNBA basketball player yeah, for Brooklyn. And the this amazing thing is you see these women who literally are the best at what they do, playing basketball. And then you see their one-year-old and their three-year-old. And you realize they've become one of the most elite athletes in the world and are had and are raising two kids. They have a kid and then they start working out and now they're still the most elite basketball player i that they're absolutely stunning and kind and amazing people i uh, i love uh i love what women they will continue to change this world for better okay did you hear that mariana you're in the right space <laughs> oh she heard it she, she... <laughs> she's smiling she's over there and and I, I feel so much better watching her sit on the rail couch because i could see you have a window Cab, which we yeah, should sit. yeah. On, on the, no. the last post you did, she was sitting. And I said, "Why is she sitting on the edge of the window?" But I see it now. Okay, <laughs> it's glass there. Yeah, she's not yeah. gonna fall out. But I always make her when I, if I'm doing a video, I, I like this little this little place. The light comes in just no, it's right. Beautiful. All right. And uh, she sits up there, and uh, I always do these better when she's sitting in the room because we talk all day every day, and she's this part of what I do. Amazing. Curtis, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. It was, it was, uh, it was a really great training about entrepreneurship, leadership, 
Uh, and I think life in general, right? Um, despite of what we're surrounded with today, which is mostly bad news, you find the good news, you make it your own, and you help other people find that happiness. That's who you are. So thank I, you again. I work, I work at I work at that. That is that's who I try to be. So I really appreciate it. I'm glad we were finally able to do this. Yes, and, thank you. Uh, and perhaps we will talk again soon. We Thanks, will. Take care. Bye.